Well, as we said before, Nehemiah chapter 3 is where we'll spend our time today. Looking at this chapter, quick review, we know in chapter 1 we learned about Nehemiah's compassion uh, for the people. And of course last week in chapter 2 we learned about his leadership skills and uh, his ability to prepare to rebuild the city walls and how he gained the support of the people. And we see there at the very end of chapter 2, we looked at it last week, but uh, in verse 18 where it said the people's response was, let us rise up and build. And they responded to his leadership. He did an excellent job in preparing them and doing his homework and doing everything he could so that he laid it all out before them. They heard all the information and they responded faithfully to us. And so now as we begin chapter 3 here, we're going to look at Nehemiah's ability to coordinate the people to effectively complete the task that's ahead of them. The title of today's message is A Lesson on Teamwork. And uh, we all know teamwork is essential. It's important. And Nehemiah, in his leadership ability, was able to coordinate them in an effective way. There was a lot to be done, as we know. And as we go through this chapter, as I said before, this is not your exciting reading material chapter, right? There's just a lot of information in here. It's in one, one of those chapters when we're in our Bible reading that we're tempted to just, oh, okay, let's just skim right through all that information. But we need to see some of the distinctions here in this chapter because you'll find out that there's some important things that we don't want to miss, uh, and uh, there's a great story here of teamwork and how Nehemiah effectively coordinated through his leadership to make sure the job got done and got done in specific ways, and, and uh, we'll talk about that as we go here. So let's observe some of these particular lessons on teamwork that obviously we gain from what happened here in this chapter and what happened here with Nehemiah. But, of course, how we can apply that, first and foremost, to ourselves and how we need to be working together in teamwork, but especially this church as you move forward. The first lesson on teamwork that we're going to look at here is the fact that unity is essential. No matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, no matter what organization you might be, you have to be unified to get anything done. And, of course, in the Church of God, unity is absolutely essential. It doesn't always mean that you all agree on everything. That does not exist. (laughs) It just does not. There's the certain things that we have to agree on, right? And, And doctrinally and all those types of things. But we're never going to agree on every little jot and tittle and every little way that things should be done and that should be done. And so as we work together as a church, it's so important to oftentimes we have to you know, act in humility. We have to be able to set sometimes our own personal preferences aside to realize that, okay, things don't have to be done the way that I think they have to be done. Or maybe the way that I kind of run my household and there's certain things, right? We do things differently and that's okay. But unity and coming together and being able to say, all right, Let's work together because it's the greater goal. It's honoring God. It's glorifying God. That's the big thing. And we want to work together to make sure God is glorified, the gospel goes forth. And so we're going to do whatever we can to make sure that we're saying no to ourselves and saying yes to honoring God and being unified. Uh, I experienced that even personally. I've been, in, obviously, in ministry for years. Uh, and in leadership for years, so that sometimes can be a challenge. And about three years ago, when we stepped aside from that, uh, we joined the church at Centro because I knew that I'd be traveling around. We still get active. We, we try to be involved in the ministry there as much as possible. Uh, but I noticed right away when I began to sit down and, you know, initially it's like, okay, well, this is kind of nice. I can just kind of sit down here and listen and watch what's going on. But You know, you notice things and you watch things and things in other places sometimes are done differently. And so as I sat there, I'm processing a couple things in my head. Number one, over over the weeks, the first few months I was there, you know, it's that temptation stopping to think. I don't think I'd do it that way. (laughs) 
Uh, maybe I would do it differently. Uh, I'm not so sure I would handle that that way. Or you know, these things process through your minds as they do all of our minds, right? We see certain things and, oh, I don't know. But I quickly came to that realization. I believe the Spirit of God helped me and guided me through that as well because I sat there and stopped to think. It's like, you know what? But that's okay. That's not my decision to make. And that's all right. And oftentimes, we have to do that, right? We have to look at a situation, and we praise God for the leadership that he has placed in certain places. I praise God for our pastor and our leadership and, and your leadership here as well. And there's times where we have to say, you know what? God put them in that place. We as a church said, yes, we want you there. He said yes to the leadership, and the leadership makes those decisions. And then we have to work together to be able to say, well, you know what? I trust them. I trust what they're doing. I trust how they're doing things. And it's okay that that happens that way. And you know what? I'm not in that position. And let me tell you, sometimes that's a nice place to be. <laughs> not having to make those decisions and to be able to relax and, and let certain things go, right? That's all a part of, of unity and coming together and saying, that's all right. Not creating friction, but allowing things to happen. And so sometimes we have to follow leadership and different things like that. But going back to Nehemiah here, we understand, I'm sure a lot of people didn't like the way that maybe Nehemiah did things. Or maybe they say, oh, I didn't agree with this. But he had the majority of the people with him. They were following him. They were on board. And there's several things that we see that he did specifically that helped them see that, okay, I see what you're doing, Nehemiah. I understand it. Uh, I can get on board with that and watch that. And the very main thing that I'm seeing in these particular verses, these first five verses that we already read just a little bit ago, as we look at unity, there's a phrase that stood out here, and maybe you caught that as we read through, where it said, in several places, and next to him, or and next to them, and if you look down through the text there, you'll see that especially, you see it through the whole chapter, but especially here through these first five verses. Um, looking at uh, uh, verse 2, next to Eliashab, and then right after that, and next to them, Zechur, and then we jump down to verse 4, and next to them, Merimoth, the son of Urijah, and then you jump down a little bit farther, and next to them, Zadok, and then verse 5, next to them. Why is that essential? Why is that important? It's because Nehemiah strategically placed people to get these jobs done. They placed them side by side. He placed them working together side by side. They didn't necessarily all have to work together on the same job, right? With the same tasks. But he lined them up together, all working together to be able to see, okay, so-and-so is doing that job, and so-and-so is doing that job, and he's working this. And we all have different gifts that we bring to the table, right? We have all different skills and abilities. And he lined them all up finishing and doing certain tasks, but to create that unity, they recognized that they were all working together for the same goal. And Nehemiah saw that in order to work quickly and efficiently, as well as to be able to protect themselves from attack, we talked about that before, we know that was a constant threat. All right, The enemy was threatening all the time. They were breathing down their necks. Even though they may not have been serious about attacks, they wanted them to be nervous. They wanted to be, them to be shaking their boots. They wanted to discourage them from building those walls. And so the threats were constant. And that was very nerve-wracking for these people, obviously, right? They didn't know. The walls were broken down. They weren't protected. They were concerned about their families. What's going to happen? And so to work all of them side by side, um, he knew that obviously the work had to be done and he needed to spread them out along that wall. If everybody in the city, oh, okay, let's just take this section and start working here and work our way around and complete a section at a time, it meant that the other side of the city was going to be vulnerable, didn't it? And so Nehemiah strategically said, you know what, we need to build this all together and we need to spread around not only for the work to get done, but to protect our city and to help everyone see, hey, we've got things covered. We're watching each other's back, and not only are we working, we're there to protect the city. And so that's why he spread them around that way, working side by side, and it provided encouragement, 
provided motivation. Hey, we can see everybody working down through, getting the job done. And, uh, and that was strategic for him to, to make sure, right? To make sure it gets done and gets done well. I think probably one of the greatest illustrations we can see of effective teamwork and unity is when you watch the Amish put a barn up. That's something to see, isn't it? But the teamwork that they go into that, they all come in with the same goal, the same mindset. They come ready to work, kids on up. And they'll put that thing up, wow, in days. And it's amazing what they can do. Can you imagine what could happen in this country if we, if we combine the Amish with like the uh, Chick-fil-A organization and leadership? Man, things would be getting done in this country, wouldn't they? I tell you, that's, I'm putting forth that plan, right? Maybe I should run for office. Wow, things could get accomplished. Put them on the, the highway department too, right? No, but side by side they worked together and that created a lot of encouragement and motivation for one another. But as always is the case, we see the end of verse 5 there, right? Not everybody gets on board. You know, that's a sad thing. It's a sad thing when not everybody. There's always got to be somebody, right? And we see that with the Tokoi nobles there. Everybody put their mind to the work. They realized they needed to get things done. But as it says there in the end of verse 5, but their nobles did not put their shoulders to the work. That is an emphasis. Some texts might say neck. That's that area of the, of the body there that kind of bears, bears the burdens, right? You know, you can carry some heavy burdens over your back and over your shoulders on those muscles. A lot of people will carry buckets of water or, you know, they'll make those types of things. That's where a lot of burdens are, are carried. And so that's the picture the text gives us here. Um, but there's always some that choose not to get involved. And that's a sad thing. That really destroys unity. To be able to look at these people for whatever reason. Maybe they felt they were better than that work. That's, that's, for, the, that's for the other people, right? That's for the lowlies, right? We'll, we'll let them do that job. Um, but some people have that mindset, right? But we all have to get motivated. We all have to get our hands dirty, as we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, you notice the reference there at the end of verse 5, where it says, and they put their shoulders to the work of their Lord. Now that particular word Lord is not referring to God, it's referring to men. And that particular word there is specifically talking about Nehemiah. And so there was an unwillingness for them to follow his leadership, uh, to work under him. He was the boss, they knew it, and maybe these nobles thought, I don't like this Nehemiah guy coming in here and telling me what to do. Uh, I don't want to follow that. And oftentimes there's going to be that, right? There's going to be dissension in the ranks. And it's a sad thing. And it, it destroys unity. And that's what Satan's been doing for a long time, is trying to attack uh, and attack the area of unity. And that's how he attacks our churches. He attacks us because we as individuals oftentimes are, are not living the way that we should be living. We're not walking with God. We're not honoring God in our individual lives we're not dealing with sin that needs to be dealt with. All those issues that happen. And, and when we're not walking with God, then we bring sin into the camp. We bring issues in. And that issues that destroys unity, that causes problems for leadership, whereas they're trying to move ahead and, and fulfill and do what you know, God wants us to do and move ahead and get the gospel out there and get involved in ministries. And yet there's always going to be those things. Well, we have to deal, we have to put this fire out. Because of this person, this person are arguing about this, and, and we have this issue. It just creates so, so many problems, and it thwarts the efforts uh, of God's people, and it thwarts the efforts of the church, for sure. But we have to be careful about that in our own lives. We have to be cautious as we move ahead. We want to be unified, and that oftentimes can mean, you know what? I need to say no to myself. Maybe things don't have to go my way. We're not talking about doctrinal issues. We're not talking about... Uh, aspects of theology here that are, you know, we can't change that. That's, that is it, right? We, the Word of God speaks. But there's so many things, right? Whether it was Nehemiah's day and the way that they were doing this and the way they were doing that, or maybe the way that we handle the building or the finances or all the little things, we have to learn how to agree to disagree sometimes to make sure that it's the unity of the church that is kept pure. And uh, fortunately, God's purposes prevailed in this particular situation, as we know. Nehemiah's leadership 
kept it from becoming a problem. He was good at dealing with things and working with people. Uh, and that was just one of those areas. Now, a second thing we want to look at here is the fact that Nehemiah made it family-friendly. As he went ahead with the work and the efforts, he was very strategic. And I want to point out a few things here. So let's look at a few verses. We're going to jump back and forth here. But look with me at verse 10, where it says, Next to them, Jediah, the son of Haramoth, uh, made repairs in front of his house. And now if we were to jump down to verse 28, we're going to see that same phrase. Each in front of his own house. And in verse 29, in front of his own house. And in verse 30, made repairs in front of his dwelling. You know, if we weren't careful in looking at that, we might jump over that. We might skip over that. But here again, Nehemiah strategically organized these people so that they could work, do the repairs that were necessary, where they lived. The areas of the wall that needed repair, all right, this guy lives here. I'm going to put him on the job right in front of his house. Why? Well, there's advantages, right? Pretty easy to get to work, right? <laughs> Wake up, jump out of bed, and go out in front and start working on the wall, obviously. But as we've already mentioned several times, all these workers, all these families were concerned about their families. Imagine if you knew that there was threats, that the enemy could attack, and that there was that constant anxiety of we don't know what's going to happen. And imagine if you were put on a job on the complete other side of the city, far away from your family. And you heard news or found out, uh-oh, the enemy has attacked or something has happened, and you can't get there. It would affect the way that these men would work. It would affect the way that all of their thinking. They wouldn't be as efficient. They wouldn't be focused. They might think, man, oh, I don't know, I'm really nervous. I, you know, I'm, I'm leaving early today. Or It would have caused them to potentially want to leave their posts. Nehemiah thought through this stuff, prayed through this stuff and thought, you know what? All this work has to be done. Let's work with these people. They're anxious. They're, they're struggling. So let's give them a job that's right out in front of their house. Let's, let's make it happen so that they're right there in front of their home, able to protect it at a moment's notice. But then they can really put their mind to the work. They can really focus and get the job done. And then on top of that, look at verse 12 again with me. Verse 12, in the very end of it, uh, we saw the leader half of half the district of Jerusalem, and it says, he and his daughters made repairs. He made it a family affair. He made it possible so that they could be at home and then not only be able to get that work done that was out in front of their house, but to be able to work with their children. Got the daughters involved in the work. So much more, so much less anxiety to deal with. And that produced a maximum effort to get things done. And as we move through this book, we know, right? The job got done, and it got done pretty quickly. But this was an effective leadership ability. This is a way that, that Nehemiah worked together and said, hey, this is how the team works together. This is how we can motivate these people to get the job done. They're concerned about their family, so let's be sensitive to that. Let's think through that and figure out ways that, that that'll calm their anxiety. They can be there for the family, get the job done, and even work together with their family, which obviously a whole lot of benefits uh, involved with that. So he made it family friendly. And then the third one here that I want to mention, kind of referenced it earlier, but it's the fact that, you know, if teamwork's going to happen, everybody's got to get dirty. <laughs> everybody's got to get their hands dirty. Everybody has to have a willingness to get involved and do whatever God has called you to do. And what's specific here? We already looked at verse 12, but if we look at verse 12 again, I already mentioned those leaders that worked together with their daughters. Just the emphasis there in the text that this was a leader. This was somebody that could have said, hey, that's for the grunts. They could have said, no, I don't have to do that job. But no, that leader of that area, they all stood up and said, I'm involved with this. I'm going to get my hands dirty. And wow, that speaks messages to the people. 
when they see that the leaders are involved and they're getting their hands dirty, they're willing to get involved in that, that motivates people. Say, all right, I can follow that. I will follow that person because they're in here doing it, right? Uh, and uh, that's so important. When that hard work comes, unfortunately, sometimes people tend to disappear. <laughs> all right? I think we notice this especially at the end of church dinners, right? <laughs> I didn't hear any amens from the ladies. That was pretty good. You restrained yourselves. That was. But I noticed that over the years, right? You know, it's like, oh man, we're all full. We're out of here, right? Before the cleanup happens. But that's those things, right? In life, oftentimes, boy, that hard work comes. Oh man, I don't know. I got enough on my plate, right? I got enough stuff going on. But to be able to be willing to say, you know what? When everybody pitches in, and you all know what I'm talking about, right? When there's jobs to be done, I know I've experienced that in ministry where I've organized events and things like that. And you get to the end of this and there's a lot of cleanup and a lot of work to do and I'm looking around and I'm like, where did everybody go? All right? And it just comes down to that handful of people left and it takes us a while to clean it up and take it all care of. But boy, when everybody sticks around, when everybody says, hey, let's get this done, how quick does stuff happen? Right? You've been involved in that. You've seen that happen. Everybody sticks around. Uh, gets things done, tears down tables. I know we have a, a men's breakfast sometime over at Central there, and of course, as soon as it's done, all the guys pitch in. Boy, within five minutes, all the tables are cleaned, everything's down, everything's put back to where it goes, and we're out of there. You know, and that's the beauty of teamwork, when we realize, hey, it's not just their responsibility or their responsibility. It's all of our responsibilities. We need to work together uh, to make sure things get done. And unlike the nobles that we already mentioned there a few verses before, these leaders were willing to get in, to make repairs, to, to do what had to be done. Um, and that's the type of leadership that speaks volumes, isn't it? Uh, that motivates people to get involved. So we just see a few things here from this particular chapter. As I said, there's, there's information here. It might seem insignificant, but I just wanted to point out to you some of these specifics that can help us to be able to see just what Nehemiah was doing and just the specific focus that he had with these people to be able to say, hey, unity is necessary. And, and we've got to make it family friendly to get people involved in, in making it happen and then be able to encourage and, and challenge people, hey, let's all come together. Let's make this happen. Does it mean we have to sacrifice? Yeah. Does it mean we're going to have to say no to certain things that maybe we want to do? Yeah. Sometimes it means we have to say no to th certain things that we kind of need to do, too, doesn't it? Sometimes we sacrifice for others, even though there's things like, I really need to get this done. I really need to get this job done. But sometimes we just have to do what needs to be done at that moment. Uh, what's right, right? And what's, what's the hard thing? There's tough decisions. We all have to make them. But that's what has to happen. And Nehemiah saw that. These people were sacrificing, and so he was going to do whatever he could to make sure that they were motivated and encouraged and would stay at this work because he knew how important it was. And I hope we understand, too, the, how important the church is and how important the work of the church is. Not just about us getting together here today, right, singing some songs, enjoying one another, uh, you know, hearing the word of God, getting our ears tickled maybe a little bit here and there, and then be able to move on. No, this is just a very, very small part of what the church is to be doing, isn't it? It's really when we leave these doors, that's when we're the church and accomplishing things for Christ. And so let's ask that question of ourselves. Individually, as a church, how's our teamwork? How is our teamwork going? Everybody has responsibilities to fulfill. And so how are we doing on that? Are we, we dive in. We're, right, don't allow that temptation to come in, folks. I hear it all the time, right? I don't know. I don't have anything to offer. I'm not good at anything. Let me tell you, there's a lot of things I am not good at. I can't build anything. All right? You do not want me swinging a hammer. It is not safe. I'm just going to tell you that right now. I can't build things. I can't fix things. I did not get any of those genes. That was my mother and my brother. They got all those genes. I got none of them. They didn't share with me. All right? So there's, I just, I can't do that stuff. My mind doesn't work that way. I'm tried to work with certain things, and you know what it's like, right? You work with certain people if they're mechanically inclined or whatever, and they can get in, well, all you got to do is take that and this and that and pick up this tool and do this. And I'm like, 
Well, you lost me at Tool. <laughs> All right. I don't even know what tool. I mean, when I used to work the shop down there, the guys would get frustrated with me because I'm like, I don't even remember what tool I used to do that before. And there's like a zillion in that drawer. They all look the same to me, okay? All right, which one's millimeters and which one, you know? It's confusing. I don't think that way. But there's things that I can do. There's things that I can figure out that I can do. And I can't use that as an excuse to say, I'm not going to show up, right, for the work day or whatever the situation may be. There's plenty of jobs to do. We can't use those excuses. Hey, you know what? All right, I've been doing this for years. It's somebody else's turn. Show me that. Show me that in here, right? We have to keep working. We have to keep giving. Maybe we slow down. Maybe we can't do as much as we used to, but we get busy, and we get active, and we figure out what we can do. And let me tell you something. The one thing that everybody can do, right, is to be praying. It's to be on our knees and just praying, right, for every situation, whether it be the ministry, the church, the search for a new pastor, whatever's going on, we all can be assisting in that way. But everybody needs to get involved in that. And we need to have that promotion of teamwork, and we do that by being a team player and getting involved and and being willing to work at it. So, just reiterating some things here this morning. Let's make sure we are promoting unity. Let's make sure we are getting our families involved. Because that's so much more important. I didn't spend a lot of time on that, but that's a whole other area, right? Getting the young kids involved. Getting everybody involved so they can say, hey, this is my church. This is where I can serve. This is where I can get busy doing things. I know there's some young boys that have come over to my mom's house and helped her out and very appreciative of that. That's, that's the beauty of the church, right? Getting them to see that they have a valuable input in the church. They can do things and help out and get involved. We're all a part of that. It's so important that getting the family involved. And then making sure that, again, we're getting dirty in the work of the ministry. We're in, involved in what we can do, and that means we might have to sacrifice some time and effort, and that's challenging and that's difficult. But it's for the glory of God, and it's for the promotion of the gospel, right? That's what's most important. Let me close in prayer. Father, we're thankful again for this book and the things that we can learn from the leadership skills and abilities of Nehemiah. And I pray that we could all apply that in our own lives as we seek to work together to honor you, that this church seeks to continue to work together as they seek their new leader, that they would be praying, that they would be working together, Uh, continuing to follow through uh, with the Great Commission and doing all that you've called us to do. Pray that there would be great unity here in this fellowship and that there would just be a great passion for you and the things of you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.